uh, still the theme of mitral valve, mitral stenosis, Dr. Carla Kerlmeyer, who's the uh, director of our clinic at the Baker Hartman Vascular Center and the cardiology department. Her interest is imaging, echocardiography, and women and heart disease. Thank you, Dr. C. Okay. So we're going to skip to um, this slide. And basically, mitral, this is demonstrating a pathology specimen of mitral stenosis. And what you see in panel A is you, you can see that the leaflet is already significantly calcified. The commissures first become calcified on both corners of, of the, the valve, and then the, the whole leaflet becomes calcified. And then you can see panel B and C, then the chordae become shortened and thickened. And when you compare them to panel D, you can see that there has been significant changes in this um, rheumatic mitral stenosis, stenotic valve. Um, rheumatic mitral stenosis was the first disease diagnosed using echo in 1968. It was the first valve lesion successfully treated with su surgery in 1923. And it was the first valve lesion successfully treated with percutaneous valvuloplasty in 1984. If you look at it worldwide, it's the second most common valvular lesion in developing countries. It's very prominent, and it's just right behind combination mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation. That's the number one valvular lesion. So when we look at rheumatic mitral stenosis using echocardiography, we've seen some of these in some of, some of Steve's slides. And basically what you see is that posterior leaflet in that upper left-hand panel, the peristernal lung, is fixed and doesn't move very well. The anterior leaflet, it moves like a hockey stick. And then when you look at it on the short axis view, quit moving here, let's see if I can get it moving. You see it open like a little fish mouth because the commissures are fused. When you look at the apical views, basically what you see is the left atrium is very, very enlarged and that's just because of the stenosis and blockage to flow. Now calcific mitral stenosis is the most common type of mitral stenosis here in the United States. And basically what that is is just calcification of that posterior uh, lateral mitral annulus, which Steve alluded to. So it starts there, it encases the whole posterior leaflet, and you can see the posterior leaflet is fixed on those peristernal views, but the anterior leaflet is relatively spared, so you can see that it has normal mobility and is opening, allows, allowing the valve to open quite well. So when you put Doppler across that mitral valve, basically you usually what you see is not more than mild uh, mitral stenosis. Now, how do we grade the severity of mitral stenosis? Well, first, we rely on pressure gradients. You heard uh, in the ECHO talk this morning that basically we just use this modified Bernoulli equation to take all those velocities under that stenotic jet, and we, we, we change them to pressure just by using 4V squared divided by the number of measurements that the computer makes under that velocity curve, and that'll give us the mean gradient across that stenotic mitral valve. Now, if you relied, though, on just the pressure gradients across that mitral valve, you would, wouldn't be accurate 100% of the time. And why is that? Because high flow rates will lead to high transmitral pressure gradients, and you may only have a, a mild or a moderate degree of valve narrowing, and that happens in patients who have tachycardias, who have mitral significant mitral regurgitation, anemia, or thyrotoxicosis. And the converse is also true, very low flow rates will lead to low transmitral pressure gradients despite severe mitral stenosis. So that, that happens in your cardiomyopathy patients with low EF and in patients with profound bradycardia. And there's significant beat-to-beat -beat variability in AFib, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And that's just because of that varying RR interval that affects your diastolic filling period. So if, diast if, if diastole is affected, well, then the amount of time that you have for that blood to grow flow across that mitral valve is also affected. And then, of course, there's some technical reasons. If you don't have your Doppler lined up with that stenotic jet, you're not going to get an accurate mean gradient. So this is a patient, and basically what we're showing on the left-hand side is we trace that continuous Doppler curve, and the computer calculated all those four V squareds and told us that that mean gradient was less than five, which tells us, well, this is just mild mitral stenosis based on the guidelines. But when you actually go ahead and calculate the valve area using pressure half time, it comes out to be 1.2 centimeters squared, which is telling you that this is moderate mitral stenosis. And this happens actually quite frequently in the echo lab. So you have to go back and look and try and figure out what's going on and which one's actually more accurate. And if you look up on the, where all the numbers are up there, what you see is the heart rate is 49 beats per minute. So this is profound bradycardia. So that prolongs your diastolic filling period. It allows that gradient between the 
left atrium and the left ventricle to degrade to almost nothing. So it's going to underestimate the severity of your mitral stenosis. This is just a cartoon depiction showing you that. So if your heart rate's very, very fast, your diastolic filling period is very short, and all of your four V squares underneath that continuous wave Doppler are gonna look like the one in the middle. They're very, very tall, so your mean gradient's gonna be very, very high. If the heart rate's very, very slow, the diastolic filling period prolongs, and then you're gonna have some short and some tall V, v squareds, four V squareds, so your mean gradient is gonna be more like that four millimeter mercury, so it's gonna be much, much lower. You can use planimetry to try and determine what your mitral valve area is, uh, and basically um, it, this, you just get that short axis view of that mitral valve, and you trace it, and you try in that, and if it's a good quality echo, it'll be fairly accurate. Um, and again, this is just an anatomic area, not a functional area, but they should correlate pretty well in most patients. Of course, there are problems with just using planimetry. If the image quality is very poor, it's not going to be accurate. It's not going to reflect that functional area. If the anatomy is very deformed, it's very hard to trace. If you use too high of gain settings, you get all this blooming artifact from all the calcium, so it's not going to be accurate at all. And if you're not at that smallest area, which is always at the leaflet tips, it's, if you're closer to the annulus, again, it's going to cause you to underestimate the severity of mitral stenosis. We can use the pressure half time to calculate the mitral valve area, and that's just 220 divided by the time that it takes for that pressure gradient across that stenotic jet to decay in half. And basically, like everything else in mitral stenosis, it has limitations. So again, in AFib, because you have that varying diastolic filling period, it not only affects the time that that pressure can decay and, the four, and also the mean gradient, but it also affects, it's gonna affect your pressure half time and, and, and the time that you have for that pressure to decay in half. If you have aortic regurgitation, this leads to high pressures in your left ventricle. Left ventricular and diastolic pressures go up. So therefore, there's early equalization, earlier equalization of pressure between the LV and the LA, which is going to, again, cause this to underestimate the severity of mitral stenosis. If you have changing LV and LA compliance, which happens due to valvuloplasty, you cannot use the pressure half time just because, again, it affects those pre that pressure gradient um, between the LV and the LA. And if you have a nonlinear early diastolic velocity slope, which that is, is depicted here, what that means is there's not a constant decay of that pressure across the mitral valve. It's changing. So you can see that with the slope. So if that slope isn't constant, at least 50% of the time, it's telling you that it, there isn't a constant pressure decay. So you can't use that to calculate your mitral valve area. <laughs> so this is an example of a patient um, who basically you can see, quit playing again, but this patient has a nice, um, had a nice um, hockey stick deformation of the anterior leaflet, has a prosthetic aortic valve, and, and, and basically you can see what we did in the top right hand uh, panel is we calculated the mitral valve area using pressure half time. And it came out to be 2.8 centimeters squared, which is not any mitral stenosis, right? So on the bottom hand panel, we calculate the mitral valve area using the continuity equation. And then in this, and in this case, we, use, we calculate the stroke volume through the right ventricular outflow tract because it's just difficult with prosthetic valves to get accurate assessment of that left ventricular outflow tract diameter. And you can see we got a valve area of 1.45 centimeters squared, which is moderate mitral stenosis. So again, we have to go back and try and figure out, okay, which one's more accurate? Does this patient have mitral stenosis or not? So in this particular case, you can tell from the upper right-hand panel that there is no constant slope, right? It's changing, constantly changing, just like in those cartoon depictions. So this is a somebody that you would not use the pressure half time to try and determine what that mitral valve area is. The continuity equation, as we showed in the last slide, is just the stroke volume through the RVOT or the LVOT divided by that time velocity integral that, uh, of that continuous wave jet. Um, and basically, there are limitations to it, too. Every single measurement that we use in mitral stenosis, there are limits. Uh, AFib, again, it's going to affect that time velocity integral just like it affects the pressure half time and just like it affects the mean gradient. If you have a fluctuating RR interval and a fluctuating diastolic filling period from that RR interval. Aortic regurgitation only affects it if you're calculating the stroke volume through the left ventricular outflow tract. And why? Because you have increased volume there due just to that regurgitant jet. So you definitely don't want to use that uh, to determine the severity of mitral stenosis. Uh, you don't want to use the continuity equation or you don't want to use the stroke volume determined through the left ventricular outflow tract. You could try using the right ventricular outflow tract if the images are good. 
And mitral regurgitation, again, that adds increased volume to that time velocity integral, which we saw in the previous slide, sits on the very bottom of the equation. So that's going to cause you to overestimate the severity of mitral stenosis because you have more volume in that particular, um, in that particular parameter. So this is an example of a patient. Again, you can see that nice hockey, dick, hockey stick deformation of the anterior leaflet up above. You go ahead and you calculate the mitral valve area using pressure half time. It comes out to be 1.2 centimeters squared. You go ahead and calculate it using the continuity equation. It comes out to be 0 0.89 centimeters squared. So we have to decide, is this moderate or is this severe mitral stenosis? So again, you have to go back and think about all the pitfalls that we just talked about. And even though I didn't show you color, you can see in the bottom left-hand panel that during systole, there's a jet there. And that jet is going to be your mitral regurgitation jet. And we talked about that, how that mitral regurgitation jet increases that parameter on the bottom, and it's going to allow you to un overestimate the severity of mitral stenosis, underestimate that valve area. So you, in that particular case, you really have to use the pressure half time. So in a lot of patients, sometimes, a lot of patients, I mean the extra large patients, they'll, you'll calculate a gradient, you'll calculate a valve area, but yet it'll come out to fall within not too bad, maybe mild mitral stenosis, but yet the patient has a lot of symptoms when they exert themselves. They get very short of breath, their physical activity is limited. So in that particular person, you have to wonder, well, maybe this valve area is not the appropriate size for them because they're you know, bigger individuals. So in those particular people, what you can do is you can order a bicycle stress echo, supine bicycle stress echo, and you can actually measure the gradient across the mitral valve as you increase the heart rate throughout the four stages of that stress echo. And you can also measure the PA pressures. And if you see that that gradient across that mitral valve doubles or and doubles to triples, and the PA pressures are more than 60 by the time you're done, that really suggests that that valve is not the appropriate size for that particular patient, and you should consider other interventions. Now, what is the role for TEE in mitral stenosis? Really not anything unless you're worried that there's a very eccentric mitral regurgitant jet that might be hidden by all the calcium on that valve. And in those particular cases, maybe the gradient is high and you're trying to figure out why because it doesn't look like it's significant mitral stenosis. You would resort to TEE to evaluate the severity of that mitral regurgitation. You also need to do TEE prior to valvuloplasty to grade the mitral regurgitation because you can only do a valvuloplasty if it's mild or less mitral regurgitation per the guidelines. And you also have to rule out a thrombus in the left atrial appendage in, in, the, in these patients because the majority are in atrial fibrillation. There is really no role for cardiac catheterization unless it's just the images are just impossible because the mitral valve really is the most visualized valve in echocardiography. So how can you determine if a patient is suitable for percutaneous valvuloplasty? Well, that relies on the splitability index or the Wilkins score, which you see here. Basically, there are four different categories. Uh, one is the mobility of the valve leaflets themselves. The subvalvular apparatus is talking about the short and thickened calcified cordae. Uh, and then the thickening and calcification at the end is talking about the valve leaflets themselves. So basically, in your patient, you just give them a score based on those descriptions there. You add it up, and if it's less than eight, they're definitely suitable for having a percutaneous valvuloplasty. If it's eight to 10, it depends on the distribution of the calcium in those leaflets. If it's more than 10, they're um, completely unsuitable for a percutaneous valvuloplasty. So basically what that looks like, so the people in the top panel, they would definitely have a score that would fall less than 10 and would be suitable candidates for uh, percutaneous valvuloplasty. When you look at the people on the bottom, you can see that the valve is becoming less mobile, very thick, very calcified. So those would be people who are not suitable for, for percutaneous valvuloplasty whatsoever. They need um, surgical options. And this is just a 3D um, picture from courtesy of Dr. Little, which just basically is showing you the very first person had a mean gradient of 10, and you can see the commissures are fused there on that valve, and then you're seeing the, the Inuit balloon going across that valve. It's now in, it's inflated, so it's crushing open those commissures, and there, and at the very end, you can see that the commissures are completely open, and the valve gradient has fallen to five millimeters, so this would be a, considered a very good result. So 
um, like Dr. Little, I'd like to refer you to the ACCAHA guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of mitral stenosis, uh, and, um, and that that's the one that was published in 2006 in circulation, and then there's also the updated guidelines in 2014, which specifically talks about the ind indications for intervention for rheumatic mitral stenosis. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, very much.